So this video is for people who have been in no contact for a while, but it's starting to feel like it's really not working. And I know that can be a really frustrating thing because being in no contact can be extremely draining, emotionally challenging. And when you've been doing it for a while and you're looking around, and especially when you're not seeing any other signs, it can feel like, like the metaphor I use is it feels like you're just staring at rocks. It feels like, hey, I've been in no contact for a while, but it's just like I'm just kind of staring at grass and watching it grow, but nothing's happening. Sometimes a volcano is forming under the surface, but you don't feel it. You won't know it until you kind of see that, that the evidence that something is actually shifting. Well, no contact can just feel like a massive waste of time. It can also feel like delusion. It can feel like rose-colored glasses. And a lot of times, especially depending on the type of person that you are, if you're one of those kind of critical thought processors, people that just think logically, that take a lot of pride in not being fooled, that would rather hear the harsh truth than hear hopeful fantasy, then no contact will feel like that, especially if you've been doing it for a while. Like, am I just kind of lying to myself? Why am I trying to convince myself of something that there's no evidence of? And especially in relationships, people still try to be very logical, even though relationships aren't built on logic. So if you're wired like that, especially no contact can not only be frustrating, it can feel like I'm just justifying something that's not working. Well, take a deep breath. And one of the things you need to realize about no contact is it's going to feel like it doesn't work. It's supposed to feel that way. Like read the comments section, especially of like, like Coach Lee has a videos that have hundreds of thousands of views. So read through those comments. Yeah, you're going to see some people where they say it doesn't work, but you're going to read a lot of comments where they say it does work. People are coming back, but you don't feel like it's going to work until it works because you're lost in pain. Your mind and your heart and your thinking, they're not as logical as you think they are. Like I hear this one all the time. This is probably the number one comment. And there'll be some jackass that puts it in the comments below. If they left, there was a reason. They're not going to come back. If they broke up with you, why would they come back? Why would you want them? Again, people are using logic. But that's, that's so ridiculous. It's not even factual. It sounds logical, but it's not. I mean, because everybody knows many couples where it's somebody, they broke up. One of them broke up with the other one, or it looked like for some time that they were, they were never going to get back together. Most couples you know have been through, shocker, spoiler alert, most people you know have been through a trying time. Even times that made it look like there was no hope for them in the end, and yet they ended up back together. So don't trust that feeling. Again, especially if you're what we kind of call that calculator or that orchestrator mentality that's really good with timelines and plans and structure and logical thinking and just critical thought process. If you're that natural high-end problem solver, it's going to feel like it's not working. That's no real evidence that that's the case. It's not actually true just because it feels true. So stop trusting logic to tell you what's going to happen. So again, one of the reasons that it feels like it's not working is that you think you're going by logic. You're not really going by logic. You're going by feeling that feels logical to you. But if you were really going by logic, if you were going by facts, then you'd be able to remember that you know a lot of people that it has worked, that it looked like they were going to break up. It looked like they were going to get back together. Me and my wife now, we broke up for a long time before we got back together. I have an ex-wife. We broke up a long time before we got back together. And I'm not the only one. Stop and take inventory of the people that you know, that you've seen the break happened and they reconnected. It's really not the end of the world. It's just it's easier to trust the current position than to have faith that a better position is coming. And a funny thing that happens when you're trying to correct your thinking. So this is normally what happens. We try to tell ourselves that I'm just believing in false hope. I'm just believing something that's not really there. I need to kind of grow up. I need to face the facts. Well, the funny thing is the person telling themselves those things, they're telling themselves that when they really shouldn't trust themselves. So as much as you're trying to look at reality with this, uh, you know, factual, I need to just face the hard truth and accept that they're not coming back. That seems like you're grinding, you're grounding yourself in logic. So you're just being truthful with yourself, except in that state of mind, you're not being truthful with yourself. If you were being truthful with yourself, you'd realize most couples do break up. Most couples do have struggles. Most couples have moments where it looks like they're not going to be together, but you're so determined to not play the fool that you won't even give yourself the reasonable, realistic amount of hope that you deserve because it seems like tormenting hope. It's not tormenting hope. It's real. So give yourself permission to have realistic hope because the truth is the mind that you should trust the least right now isn't the world telling you that there's hope with no contact. The mind that you shouldn't trust right now is your own because you're in that state of mind. You're in that dark limerence. And that dark limerence is what you feel after a breakup. Literally, your mind is kind of rewiring itself and I'm sure that you love your ex. I'm not trying to tell you that's based on a, a fallacy or a fantasy. 
I'm sure you really love your ex. After a breakup, you love them even more than you really love them. The same hormones that come in and give you that limerence at the beginning that make you see them as just a little bit perfect, as a little bit exciting, as a little bit more exciting, as a little bit the perfect person, you know, your knight in shining armor or the only love of your life. That's that limerence. That's that oxytocin, the serotonin, the dopamine, the adrenaline, the vasopressin. Like there's a hormone cocktail that hits you when you fall in love. There's another hormone cocktail that hits you when they break up with you. Both of them are overwhelming. It's either overwhelming. I can't believe I found this soulmate. This is my twin flame. This is the love of my life. But now at the end, it's this is my source. This is my purpose. This was my destiny. I'm never going to find somebody that understands me that I understand as much as this person. So in both cases, you're setting them on a pedestal. Neither case is the true reflection of them. Now, you're going to think that I'm wrong. You're going to think, well, he doesn't really understand. I get that what he's telling everybody is true in the, for the most part, but he doesn't know my ex. He doesn't know what I did to cause this breakup. He doesn't know that I really, I, I'm really the purpose behind it. I really should have been stronger. I really should have been better. A lot of you are thinking that right now. So how you see that person to you, it's kind of untouchable. And if somebody comes along and says, hey, they weren't really perfect. The truth is you could find somebody else to make you just as happy. Instinctively, you're going to defend them. Your mind is going to kind of warp them just a little so that however great they are, they're going to be even more great to you. If on a scale of one to 10, maybe, maybe they really are a nine. In your mind, they're, they're an 11 plus. They're going to seem even more untouchable. And you're going to be harsher with yourself because what you're going through, there's a part of your mind that kind of gives you a sense of stability that kind of measures your experience versus your understanding of reality. When you go through a breakup, one of the reasons why it seems worse than death is because in some ways it is, it rattles you more. I don't mean worse than your death, although that feels that way too. What I mean is sometimes that, that pain is more intense than even if you had a loved one pass away. What's happening is your version of the past, what you need to kind of have a sense of peace and a sense of stability is a strong idea of the past, present, and the future of reality. When you're going through a breakup or you're going through a real extreme crisis, all of a sudden the past, especially with a breakup, you're thinking about your time together with them. And you know it was amazing. You know it was incredible. But if it was incredible, why aren't they with you now? If they really did love you as much as it seemed like they loved you, how are they leaving you now? So your past is somewhat shaken. You're overanalyzing to see what you did or you know what you did and you're overanalyzing beating yourself up. And in the present, you really feel rattled because you just lost a person that you didn't think you were going to be without. So your past and your present is rattled. You think into the future. You can't even think about the future because it's too dark. It's too painful. You're imagining yourself alone or you're imagining yourself trying to find somebody that does their best to get you over the real loss of the love of your life. So your life seems dark, seems hopeless, seems full of despair. It's not true. Take a deep breath. Don't believe what that feeling is painting for you as a future. Don't believe it. Please don't believe it. It's unreliable. That feeling you're feeling right now is so intense that it feels undeniably true. But something can be real and not be true. And that feeling you're feeling isn't trustworthy. You're going to do something else that's more painful than imagining a lonely future for yourself. You're going to imagine a very happy future for them with someone else. And again, in the moment, it seems real. It not only seems real, it seems this close to undeniable. And it feels like the only thing that stops it from being undeniably true is your faint hope. In other words, your mind's going to say, I bet they're going to end up with that person. I bet they're going to find that life. I bet they're never going to look back. And then I'm going to live the rest of my life in regret. I bet that's going to happen. And then some little voice of hope will say, hey, you don't know that's the case. You still have a chance. You can still get them back. And then you're going to try to drown that voice out. No, that's just a painful voice of hope trying to tease me with something that I want to be true, but it's not going to happen. So you'll kind of beat that voice down inside of you. That voice is true. It's the pain that's lying to you. So just take a deep breath and don't trust it. Another thing we do if we've been in no contact for too long is we start to hyperfixate on the numbers. In other words, the most general advice will say after 30 days, 45 days, 60 days. Another one is 90 days. That's when your ex comes back. Well, no contact is really painful. So at the beginning, especially, you set those markers. Hey, I can do no contact. I can do it for at least 30 days, especially if you've already tried, if you've already chased, if you've already pleaded, you might be in a position where no contact is your only option. It's not like you chose it. It's just the only strategy left. So if you've gone through that, going through no contact can be really painful. So you set that marker. 30 days. It's like a marathon. When I get to the 30 days, hopefully they will have reached out. If not, I've kind of earned my shot. Maybe you've already taken that 30 day shot. So you're going to tell yourself, oh no, I hit 30 days. I hit 45. I hit 60. 
Maybe you even hit 90 and you're thinking, now I don't have a chance. Now I'm going to throw that Hail Mary. Don't. Just take a deep breath. Those, those dates are for really general situations. The truth is, I, I don't know the situation of the person watching this video. I can tell you this. I can tell you this for a fact. There have been millions of couples that have gotten back together after 90 days. So don't take that 90 day marker as a death sentence. Even though I know that, that that's mentioned a lot in breakup videos, and it, it's a good standard marker, but it doesn't mean it's over. It depends on the situation. But if you're focused on that day, that day is going to feed the anxiety. And it's going to be like one more piece of evidence to you and your untrust trustworthy mind right now that it's not going to work. It doesn't mean it's not going to work. It just means that it feels that way. So if you're hitting one of those markers, just take a deep breath. Feel a little bit of self-admiration for yourself that you've been able to stay in no contact this long. And look at every painful day that you went without reaching out. Look at it as a stone that you just put back into the wall of attraction that you're rebuilding. If you went 30 days, 45, 60, or 90 days, and they haven't reached out, I can promise you this. If you haven't reached out for that long, at minimum, you've increased their level of respect for you. You've increased their level of expectation of the kind of strength that you've shown, especially if you chase them. You don't want to tear all that down just for one more plead. Now, if you get to that point and you decide that I can't take no contact, I, I just need to kind of burn the ships. I need to find out if we have a chance or I need to move on. Keep in mind, if you decide that you're just going to reach out to just move on or you're not, maybe I hear this a lot too. I've been in no contact for two months. You know what? I think I'm just going to move forward now. I'm not going to do this anymore to try to win them back. That's fine. Take a deep breath and realize you deciding that you're now in no contact to get over them, it doesn't actually lower your chances of winning them back at all. A lot of times I'll see clients that'll say, hey, thank you for the help. I've been able to focus on myself and I've realized I don't need to wait on just them. I'm going to start dating again. I'm going to get back into the real world and just move forward. Great. A lot of times that's the moment that draws them back. And I'm not saying it's a mystical thing, but there's some aspect that's kind of undeniable when somebody decides that they really are strong enough to move on and stops pretending like they're strong enough to move on. A lot of times you have to start out pretending in order to actually build the strength to realize you are strong enough to not just be pretending, but you've actually reminded yourself of your own value. But that doesn't mean because you've decided to give up and move forward, that it stops working. They might reach out to you anyway, so don't feel like if you hit a certain time frame that it's over. That's just not the case. If they started dating somebody else, and this happens a lot too, things kind of get confused. Look, if your ex has started dating somebody and they're in a rebound, the chances are that on average, that puts a significant pause on it. So take that 30 days out. If your ex started dating somebody else and you're counting and building towards that 30 days, 45 days or 60 days, just put a pause button on that. The truth is most new relationships take about two to four months to play out. So that doesn't mean that just because they started dating somebody else that they're gone forever. So if your ex started dating somebody else, even if it's a rebound relationship, that's going to put the pause button on there for a couple of months. So stop looking at that 45, 30, 60 or 90 day mark as the, as the final test. It's not. It's just a general rule. But check the comment section below. When this video has been up for a while, there will be people in there telling you that yes, no contact worked for me and it was over one, two, three months. So stop counting those general time frames that one month, two months, 45 days, 90 days. Yeah, those are general timelines. But if they don't come back by then, that doesn't mean that it's over. There's a significant number of people that come back even after that. The other thing that's going to make it feel like it's not working is when people are doing really good in no contact on the outside, but internally they are hyper fixated on checking all the details of that other person. And I've, I've kind of called this the, the chaos chain before. But what I mean by that is it's when people find a little bit of information and I hear these kind of things all the time. I'll hear that oh, I've been watching their Spotify and they just created a playlist. I can tell they're really happy. Um, I've been checking their Venmo account and I saw that they paid for putt-putt. They never go putt-putt. They must have gone to play putt-putt with somebody that really likes golf and they're trying to impress them, even though I know she doesn't like putt-putt. And if she's trying to impress them that much, she must be in love with him. And I bet their families went and I bet they announced their engagement and I bet they're picking out wallpaper and I bet they know the name of their third child. You get the idea. It just starts. You find out a little piece of information. I noticed one new follower on Instagram. Oh, and they both have a dog. I think that they're going to be together forever. I mean, that's how every Walt Disney movie starts. Somebody on Instagram, they both have dogs and they're, they live happily ever after. Don't trust your own thought process. What you're going to tell yourself is if I can get enough information, I can make a better strategy. If I have a better strategy, I have a better chance to win them back. And all of a sudden you have your mission. Now you just need to go do recon. 
It doesn't work. You doing your mission, you, you going on recon and pulling information is going to make you start building these fantasy worlds and they're all going to be scary. You're not going to think that, oh, they went to play putt-putt because they, they, they wanted to get out and, and cheer themselves up because they've been at home silent and sad thinking about me. I bet they're on the verge of reaching out to me. Your mind is not going to paint a happy, a happy picture because you're going to be afraid of false hope like we talked about earlier. So don't trust that. And when you stay hyper fixated on it, whether you know it or not, you are making them your purpose. Subconsciously, you're telling yourself that this is how you need to spend your life, that this is your purpose, that this is your goal. And the more you, you reinforce in your own mind that they are the purpose of your day, the more you're going to judge yourself by how successful you are and how they feel about you. So you end up kind of beating yourself up instead of focusing on making the better version of you, instead of working on the things that actually project strength, then you're actually kind of taking away that strength. And when you hyper fixate on them, when they come back, after you focused on them every day to that degree, it's like a rubber band that's been stretched across the country. And all of a sudden when they come back, that tension's gone and it's a whiplash effect. What's known as buyer's remorse, like what Coach Lee mentions is buyer's remorse. I kind of call it the whiplash effect. Because when you're, when you're hyper fixated on them while they're gone, you can't help but be excited when they come back. And yeah, maybe you have a really strong moment in the beginning, but if you've been missing them and hyper fixating on them for so long, do you really think you're going to be able to hide how excited, how overjoyed, and how, how, how afraid you are of losing them again? Because this has been your only goal. So when they come back, you treat them with care. You become hyper attentive. You become aware of every little thing. You start monitoring yourself. It took me a long time to win them back. Oh my goodness, I spent every day looking at details, formulating this plan, and now it works. Okay, now everybody be really still. Everybody be really careful. I don't want to mess anything up. That whole attitude of, I don't want to mess anything up, is really unattractive and emotionally exhausting. So if you haven't spent the time in no contact, sincerely focusing on yourself, and partly winning them back because you've been able to reproject your own meaning, your own purpose, your own sense of identity, then when they come back, it's really hard to hold that facade together long. And when they find out just how relieved, just how euphoric, and just how overjoyed you are to have them back, it relieves a lot of that pursuit tension, and suddenly they might find themselves pulling back all over again, and then you're going to start to panic. What did I do? What did I break? What did I ruin? This was working perfectly. Well, a lot of times after a breakup and then a recovery, a lot of times it's going to be like, okay, dark limerence, we're back together. Joy, happiness. Well, then after that, you're still going to drop out of that. And when that other person drops out of that new limerence, you're going to really panic because you've hyper fixated on doing everything you can to get them back. So when they naturally take a half step back, you're going to panic and start chasing them again. And next thing you know, you might be in that breakup cycle and that breakup loop all over again. So it's a big deal to not hyper fixate while they're gone. It makes the time last longer. It makes the panic and the anxiety stronger. And it makes it really hard to maintain that sense of resilience and strength that you projected in order to win them back. And then the fourth case when it seems like it's not going to work. And this is the scariest one. And this is the one a lot of relationship coaches don't want to get into. What if they broke up with you? And you didn't actually cause it. Maybe you didn't do something horrendous. Maybe you didn't like eat their goldfish or kick their dog down to the basement. Maybe you didn't do anything that's just obviously bad. Maybe they broke up with you because they found somebody else. Genuine attraction was lost in spite of the fact that you didn't do anything wrong. And the person that they're with and their mind, and just to use a harsh term, in their mind, they leveled up. Because the truth is, sometimes when people break up with you, it's not because you did something wrong. It's not because they're a really bad person. Sometimes it just feels like they just found somebody that fits them better. Or sometimes they find somebody that just seems like they're more impressive. And it's not something that we like to admit. But most of us, most of us have broken up with somebody because we were more attracted to someone else. Sometimes if we're honest with ourselves, we're going to feel like the person that they broke up with us for is better than us. Like I've talked to clients before that will say the truth is, you know, she broke up with me and this guy goes to the gym all the time or this guy's got a really good job or this guy is like 10 years older and he's already got a house and he's already got this, this success in life. And I don't know how to compete with that. Well, if it feels like the person broke up with you for somebody that you actually think is better, hyper fixating on that breakup and trying to win them back and the details is going to actually really put a, a damper. It's going to really put a long delay on you being able to kind of rebuild yourself. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you should compete with the person that they broke up with you for. Like if they broke up with you for Brad Pitt, don't go try to turn yourself into Brad Pitt Part 2, but turn yourself into the 2.0 version of you if you, you can identify areas where you've just kind of let yourself go. I don't mean physically. I mean, maybe it's physical. 
but maybe you just took not only the person that you were with for granted, maybe you took yourself for granted. One of the things that can really make a difference, it just takes more time and it's more challenging. But if you want to know a real answer to winning your ex back, a lot of times it's taking your eyes off of them long enough to really focus in on yourself. Like I've got some clients that have really kind of transformed themselves. Like I could post before and after pictures of this is what they look like, this is what they look like now. And I don't just mean physically. I mean, they really focused in on their career. They focused in on their passion. Maybe they started a business. Maybe they wrote a screenplay. Maybe they've done something. And maybe it started off them trying to remind their ex of their value. But a great thing can happen when you're trying to remind your ex of your real value. A lot of times you end up reminding yourself of what you're capable of. So in the beginning, one of the great things about no contact is the principle of belief versus actions. So when you're starting no contact, your belief might be that you're not good enough to win them back, that you're not strong enough to live without them. But if you're doing no contact, part of it is projecting strength and projecting a sense of confidence and resilience about yourself that you won't actually feel. But if you keep up with consistent actions, your actions will transform your belief. You will start to feel stronger. You will start to feel yourself worthy of them. You will start to remind yourself you fall in love with you the same way you're trying to get them to re-fall in love with you. And it works. But when you're hyper fixating on that person, then you are, you're still kind of feeling bad. Because when you're fixating on them, think about what you're doing. You're constantly lifting up somebody. You're putting somebody else on a pedestal. You're reminding yourself of how valuable they are. Well, you can't consistently and simultaneously consider someone else and their opinion and their worth to be so high who's choosing not to be with you without reframing yourself as something less than you are. Like if my wife broke up with me and I just started kind of hyper fixating on her, almost idealizing her and thinking that she's the greatest woman in the world. And by the way, I think she is. But if she broke up with me and I stayed fixated on her, reminding myself daily that this is the greatest woman in the world while she's rejecting me, what does that say about me? And even if you don't consciously think that, your mind and your heart are aware of that. Well, we're chasing this person that's kind of on this untouchable level. And of course she doesn't want me. But if she doesn't want me, what does that say about who I am? So you're kind of handcuffing your own belief in yourself by refusing to stop idealizing and hyperfixating and focusing on just that other person. In order to win them back for multiple reasons, you have to be able to disconnect. So stop hyper-focusing on that person and thinking that it's not having an effect on, on them coming back. It's also going to make time seem like it's passing much, much more slowly and quickly at the same time. You'll agonize for the 30 days and you'll feel every second of it. But before you know it, that 30 days is over. And even though it seemed like it took forever, now it seems like it went by fast because you looked at that 30 days as the marker of true or false, live or die. This is the ultimate test. So don't look at it that way. So those are a few reasons why no contact feels like it's not working. And it seems like for you, it's just not going to be the route that gets the person you love back. But your situations can be different. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching calls. Let me know if I can be of any help. You can find my calendar at dotheylovemecom And leave some comments in the sections below. And let me know why you think no contact can feel so definitely like it's not going to work. And give me some stories below where it felt like it wasn't going to work. And then they came back. So thanks a lot. I'll talk to you again soon.